AC Grayling, philosopher, author, and master of the new college of uh, the humanities. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. How are you? Yes, very well, thank you. Enduring isolation. Um, I would like to talk to you today specifically about the ethics around the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and something that interests me is this balance between the deaths from the pandemic and our economy, the preservation of our economy. How do you as a philosopher address this balance of the now in protecting the elderly and the future um, in debting the young and the productive? Well, it brings into very stark focus uh, the question of exactly where we are going to uh, place our values. You know, what, what matters more? Uh, and it looks like a competition between the present and the future. It looks like competition between the young and the old and so on. But in fact, I don't think that it should be cast in those terms at all. Because uh, if we go back to 1939 and we ask the question, would a six-year war damage the economy and therefore should we not fight it? And I think the answer, I hope, would have been fairly unequivocal, that the evil of Nazism uh, and uh, you know militarism was uh, so great that uh, you would you would pay almost any cost to defeat it because there are things that matter more. And the things that matter more in life are human lives. And, you know, that, that's, that's a kind of cliche sort of noise, that, that phrase, human lives. But think of it. It's people you love. It's people who are parts of families. It's friends. It's parents. It's the children of, of parents. It's the person you've married and lived with for, you know, 10 years, 20 years. It, it, human lives are, are vivid things. Each one is a world, the whole world. And just to be cavalier about it and to say, okay, we've got to take this on the chin, you know, let lots of old and vulnerable people die. Because actually, from the point of view of cold rationality, which I presume is what uh, Mr. Cummings prides himself on, uh, what a great thing to do. Just, you know, clean out all the care homes and uh, free up a lot of geriatric beds in hospitals can be used for other things. I mean, from, from the you know, harsh logic, just let it happen. But then in, in, in life, in, in ethics, in ethos, in what kind of people we are, what matters to us, and, and what the meaning of an individual life is. You know, you, you would have the same attitude that you had in 1939. You would say, the economy is much less important than this. That's a, um, yeah, introducing that value judgment, I think, is a very important way of looking at this. However, my concern is that the decision becomes uh, life versus life. So uh, during uh, a period of recession, we know that people die, um, whether it's potential cancer patients to people who are literally on the breadline and can't afford to buy food. You know, the, the consequences are varied. And therefore, are we essentially making a utilitarian judgment about weighing up the lives now versus the lives that could be lost by the very significant economic consequences of the lockdown that we're currently experiencing? Sure. Now, those consequences are going to be very significant. I agree with you. <clears throat> but it's very much a matter of policy as to how we cope with it and how we provide a kind of safety net. I mean, it's one thing to think about policies that would stop people um, starving to death on, on the breadline, and another thing to stop people uh, dying a horrible death from COVID-19 infection. It's a matter of policy. Both of them are matters of choices, but you, know, you, you could institute um, a, a recovery program and financial help uh, and um, welfare provision which would soften the blow tremendously in a period of economic recovery in a way that you can't do. You, can't, you have no magic wand similar to that for dealing with the COVID thing. So I would say, uh, you know, let us be a society that cares about human life, human experience, about our relationships, about our friendships and family. Let's care about that. And then <clears throat> it is going to have a huge impact on the economy. So let's think about how we can all work together. I mean, there are lots of things to be said about that. There are lots of ways of, you know, getting some people to pay taxes. Uh, I saw something just recently which uh, suggests that the amount of tax that isn't paid by some people uh, is, is more than the budget for the NHS. So, you know, we, we could kind of reconfigure things a little bit or think about how we could spread the burden and, and share it. That has to be possible. In the... Um the remo stepping away from that value judgment and and the if you looked at this through a, a cold a seriously cold lens i mean there is an argument that a pandemic is one of the one of the few things that actually 
can equalize our society. Um, whether it's, I mean, the others, I'm thinking about Walter Scheidel's The, the Great Leveler, um, mass mobilization, warfare, violent revolution, state collapse. He makes the point that these things are essentially the only method for bringing about a reduction in, in income inequality. Um, do you think that in this instance, COVID could be a great leveller? Um, or is or is it too early to call? Is the pandemic perhaps not severe enough for that to be the case? Most certainly could be. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've been in lockdown for a long time. There's nothing sinister about that. <laughs> um, yes, it, it most definitely could be. Um, but uh, the big question is, will it be? I mean, it is an opportunity to try to deal with some of the income uh, inequality, some of the injustice in our society. I mean, we see it across the board. There are other things, too, like recalibrating our view about who really matters in our society. You know, how, how important is a hospital porter? How important is a hedge fund manager? You know, we've got to just think a little bit about where we, we, we tend to hand out the prizes. But um, the big question is, will it? Because, of course, the majority of people are mad keen for everything to get back to quote unquote normal. You know, now this is a big opportunity not to go back to normal on, on lots of things that, we, that really we're, we're faced with uh, some, uh, some real possibilities that we could grasp here. If only we could clear away some of the noise. And, and there's a lot of noise around at the moment. You know, we're all a little bit, tiny little bit panicked. We don't want to get that illness. We don't know how long it's going to last. There's a lot of uncertainty. We hear all sorts of rumors, you know, can I inject myself with disinfectant to cure myself? You know, there's a lot of rubbish out there, a lot of noise and, and uh, distraction. Uh, and so picking up, uh, picking up on the things that really matter. And some of what has emerged in Spain, the idea of a, a, a national wage. In um, Denmark and, and in France, the idea that, well, we're not bailing out companies uh, parked in tax havens. You know, there, there are a lot of little uh, straws in the window of that kind. And we could think about reorganizing and recalibrating a little bit to, to make our society uh, a, a, a more just, a more thoughtful society, and one where we emphasize the fact that a society is and should be a kind of mutual cooperative uh, endeavor. And in fact, also we're, we're learning, and this is something no doubt we'll come on to too, but uh, um, you know, no nation state can go it alone in this any more than it could in a, in a major global war. And we are learning the folly of not being signed up to partnerships and cooperation internationally as well. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's a very interesting um, point. And my, my interest perhaps here is, I think there was a, there was a meeting of um, the 1922 committee, very um, powerful and sort of a, a symbol of the bellwether, if you like, of the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom. And apparently it was very tense. And there was a lot of concern about the speed at which the UK could reopen its economy because of the concern that the lockdown is having on small businesses and things like that. In this instance, which, I mean, if there's pressure for that, you could argue that that would indicate a preference for preserving the economy over potentially the lives of people who are going to be affected by this virus. Uh, I mean, these are the, potentially some of the same people who are happy to damage the economy in, in the name of sort of abstract concept, abstract concepts like nationality, patriotism, and sovereignty. I mean, what do you think that speaks to about the governing governing party at the moment? Well, I mean, it's a luminous example of hypocrisy. You know, uh, we, we, we'll pay, uh, uh, and it won't, of course, be the people who are um, mad keen on Brexit, because they're, they're not going to be uh, affected by the consequences of Brexit. They're insulated against it. They've got plenty of money. Um, their freedom of movement is not going to be limited. I mean, so there's no problem for them. Other people have got to carry the can. Um, so they're prepared to, to accept that in the case of Brexit, but now they're seriously worried about something that really might uh, reach all the way up to them. You know, it puts me in mind of, of what happened when a sewerage system was at last uh, voted for for London. By, by Parliament back in the middle of the 19th century. That was when the sewage in the Thames backed up to Westminster and they could at last smell it. And then and only then did they do anything about it. And this is a perfect example of that. So as I say, it's, it's a terrific uh, example of hypocrisy. But it is also an example of, of um, you know, a, a certain kind of folly as well, because at the moment, all the noises we're hearing coming out of government are, oh, no, no, we're going to stick to the extension deadline. We're, we're not going to, you know, and, and, and this, is, this is not a double whammy. Brexit and COVID. This is a treble whammy because the, the run up to Brexit and all the uncertainty over the last few years 
and the effect on the National Health Service of thousands of nurses and doctors uh, leaving, we're already feeling the consequences of. So, you know, the, the whole Brexit uh, um, disaster has already hit. Now COVID is coming on top of that. And then uh, actually leaving with the extension being over will be the third whammy. So at very, very least, the sensible thing to do now is to pause one disaster and deal with the other one. Pause Brexit. Uh, and I think at least, uh, you know, two years. I mean, if, if everything is back to, to normal and um, you know, people are making their, their profits again and the dividends are great and so on in 18 months, well, then do it then. But, you know, they should pause it now. So this anxiety um, felt by, by people whose own pockets and whose constituents' pockets are, are kind of driving their decision making. What they should be doing is they should be walking the wards, even if only, you know, electronically. They should be thinking about um, the, the fact that a single job lost, a, a single death in a family. These are huge things for real people. And that's what, that really is what should be driving decision making now. I think there was also, um, I, read, I read reports, I believe it was in the Times, maybe the Sunday Times, um, that some civil servants who would have been involved in things like pandemic planning um, and sort of the UK's response to that had been drafted in to focusing on no deal preparation and things like that. And potentially we've also hamstrung ourselves there. Your point actually about the, the wealthy perhaps not being as affected by this interests me because one of the ways that I see our world changing is I can't see sort of our hyper-globalized extended supply chains perhaps being as extended as they have been. I think, you know, the concept that the UK doesn't grow its own food, I think is probably going to shift pretty radically. Same for a lot of medical supplies. But if we see the collapse of things like airlines, um, the, the, the concept of international travel going to become very expensive, the wealthy will still be able to use it, won't they? And it's potentially the, the, the least well off in our society who are going to feel this the most. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the key difference between Brexit and COVID is that uh, the, the people who are better off are not so affected by Brexit, but but anybody can catch the virus. That's the thing. They're, they're not immune to the virus in the way that they are to the Brexit consequences. So that's the key difference. I mean, here here, here is a, um, a a little factoid, which sort of feeds into this discussion about what happens after after COVID, if ever there is an after COVID. And the factoid is this: if you ask people what percentage of fresh water is consumed in the United Kingdom. Uh, which is consumed in our kingdom, is imported. What, what proportion of our fresh water consumed here is imported? Now, this is, this is a, a, a startling thing that was asked me by a guy called Arjen Hoekstra, who is Mr. Water Footprint. He's, a, he's an expert on, on uh, um, global water at a university in the Netherlands. And I was thinking Evian and, you know, all that bottled water. He told me that 70% of the fresh water we consume in the UK is imported in the form of fresh fruit and vegetables imported from countries where there is a water shortage. Now, there are just so many, you know, spikes coming off that, uh, that thought. When you think about flying in uh, water, which is essentially what oranges and tomatoes are, okay, from countries where they haven't got enough water so that we can consume water here all year round in our supermarkets flying them in, so damaging the economy, doing a silly thing, moving water around, you know, all that. When, when you think about all that, and then you think, is that sustainable? Is, is air freight going to be as sustainable in future as it is now? You know, are we going to have to readjust? You know, there, there are people who are thinking when they see wildlife roaming the streets of, of uh, towns and eating their nicely clipped hedges around their gardens and stuff, that uh, the one place which is doing some breathing at the moment is the planet. Now, you look at pollution in Delhi. There have got to be some people, there are some people who say, hang on a second, we just simply cannot go back before this because this has taught us so many tragic, sad lessons for, for people who, who have lost people they love, but also so many other lessons about how stupidly we run the world and we run our economies. And that, that's a lesson that um, if it really is learned, if it really, you know, it's not just uh, above your eyebrows, but but in your belly. If you take that lesson seriously, then it could make a big difference. Yes, yeah, so I wonder if um, this. I hope I, you know, I think it's a bit of naivety in me because I actually imagine that as soon as 
these restrictions are lifted, I think people are going to be back out driving their cars, flying in planes yeah. with a newfound ferocity um, to you know taste and experience the things that they've been denied. But there is a small part of me. I hear that I hear the bird song in London in a way that I haven't heard since I've lived here, and I do. I wonder whether we could live like this if people who maybe realise they don't need to be going into the office every single day, people business business people who fly regularly for work realise that actually I don't need to be in Rotterdam twice a month to for, for these meetings. I, I don't know whether we'll whether we'll recalibrate in that way, but I, I certainly hope we do. Um, no, look, I think you're. I think you're right. I think people are in a, Most people are in a desperate hurry to get back to what what, what they think of uh, as normal, and normal is right because they're comfortable and familiar with it, and they just want the world to be like that. I mean, look at these people who are demonstrating in the U.S. You know, my freedom to catch COVID. You know, I want to get to the hairdresser and all that, all that stuff. You know, pe people are desperate for that, and um, they will rush to it as soon as the opportunity comes, unless the conversation really catches on unless more and more people are made aware of, of the possibilities here and uh, become part of the story. I, I would like your um, assessment, Anthony, of this sort of back and forth finger pointing we about the EU procurement scheme for PPE. Um, did we miss the email? Did we ignore the email? Was it a political decision? The senior civil servant who said that it was a political decision rode back and wrote a letter to the select committee where he'd said that seemed like a very unusual thing to do for someone in his position. Um, I mean, what's what's your reading of that? Is this is this a government that's allowing its response to something very scientific and very real to be potentially clouded by dogma? Well, I mean, that's certainly the way I see it, because it seems to me, um, you know, uh, in, that it would be incredible if Brexit weren't in the background and if there weren't uh, this very strong partisan line which says don't give the, the, the pro-EU types any ammunition at all. Don't give them an opportunity to say, see, look, we, we need our partners, we need to be part of this, uh, this whole um, setup. Don't give them the ammunition. We could do this on our own. You heard uh, um, Gove talking about, well, you know, um, there's nothing that the EU could offer us that we couldn't do independently. Uh, are obviously falsely. So this is just one among a number of missteps. I mean, we're seeing a, a government that hasn't taken a single, you know, firm step in, in anything that's happened in the last few months has been stumbling along all the time. And this is because, you know, look, I mean, well, we have to take a few steps back here and just, just, just look at a picture that we're presented with at the moment. Our, our our political and constitutional order in this country is so dysfunctional that it can be hacked as easily as pie. And it has been right from 2016 and even before um, the system has been has been hacked. Uh, the, the, the simplest, clearest and most uh, uh, directly um, significant aspect of this is our electoral system. So we have a first past the post uh, plurality electoral system, which back in December, produced an 80-seat majority for the Conservative Party over all other parties on the basis of 43% of the votes cast, which represents 29% of the total electorate. Now, just on those simple numbers, you've got to ask yourself, how is it that our system can deliver into the hands of a very, very, very partisan group with a very gung-ho agenda that they want to force through total power? We've got a sovereign parliament, we have no codified constitutional restraints on what that uh, parliament can do. The, the House of Commons is a rubber stamp mechanism now for the um, for the Leave EU group, which is now uh, you know squatting in Downing Street, and so th th they can run the show, and, th and that's what they're trying to do. Except, of course, um, they're not doing it very well. This is because you know uh, winning a campaign by promising all sorts of things and distorting the truth about other things is not really great preparation for being in government. So, so the, the background picture here is that we have produced a, uh, a governing um, uh, arrangement which is palpably incompetent. It, it just simply hasn't dealt with this in a way which is at all thoughtful. It's been in, in highly doctrinaire. I'm sure there was a conversation in Downing Street in which uh, uh, Cummings and other people, because you know this has Dominic Cummings fingerprints all over it. This idea of taking it on the chin and let the COVID thing go through—absolutely his way of thinking about things. 
that they, they decided, they said, uh, okay, everybody else is going to be closing down, their economy is going to be damaged, let us not close down. In fact, we know it's on the public record, Boris Johnson said it in a speech, uh, uh, you know, uh, early on in this, uh, we, we will... Um, We'll take this on the chin. I'm not thinking about his his television uh, performance. This was a, a speech to some organisation. I think back in uh, whenever it was in early March. And we we will um, uh, keep powering forward uh, economically. We'll let this uh, um, uh, virus get through uh, and and pass on. Because then, of course, there was the naive view that. Uh, all those who survived it would be immune to it afterwards, and then we would have so-called herd immunity. Now, in amongst all the cloud of rumours and, and um, suppositions that are circling around at the moment, that doesn't, doesn't seem to be so. So even the herd immunity idea, the only country which is really doing it officially is Sweden. We're still doing it unofficially here, of course. Uh, but but you know, then, now there's this big doubt as to whether you really will protect the economy by allowing it to happen. So point in brief, very dysfunctional background order, produces uh, a, a governing arrangement which is palpably in, incompetent and which is still so wedded to its, its doctrinaire ideological commitment to Brexit that if we don't manage to get that extension, things are going to be even, m even worse than they are now. Just to come back on what you're saying, I mean, this is, based, this is the first solid majority that the system has returned for... I mean, a long time. I mean, would you go back to 2007? I mean, it's, it's more than more than 10 years. We pretty much since then, we've been fairly, fairly split. And I think it's been fairly reflective of actually the nation. And I would argue, therefore, it's done a pretty good job. I mean, if you look at all that parliamentary toing and froing over um, the Brexit legislation, I mean, I think that's pretty accurate broadly of how the country felt about it at the time. Um, I also wonder whether having a codified constitution um, would potentially be to our benefit because I think one of the massive merits of our political system in it being uncodified is it provides us with the nimbleness and the democratic freedom to be able to adjust and adapt to the situations that we're seeing. I mean, for example, could you see this coronavirus legislation being passed through if we had co codified, you know, sort of inalienable rights to liberty and freedom to bear arms would be obviously this the obvious ridiculous one. Um, could could you could you see in those instances? Um, having a codified constitution of being to our benefit. Well, you're in great danger here of, uh, of setting me off on a rant because just a um, couple of months, um, six weeks ago or so, I published a book called The Good State in which all these points are, are set out and argued in, in very great detail. Plug the book, I, plug the book. Uh, uh, plug the book, absolutely. But, but there it all is, uh, um, cogent and clear. For me, for me, the last 10 years or so have been uh, a far better situation politically in, in our country uh, for, for, from the operation of parliament um, that, than we've seen for a long time. It seems to me that the two years up to the election in December, where there was no uh, secure majority for the government, parliament really did its job. That's what, that is what parliament should be for. Individual MPs having a big impact in debate, Every single measure that the government wanted to push through had to get through on its merits if it was going to get through at all, and not just rubber stamp through because there's an automatic majority for the leg for the executive. So I think actually it's completely the other way around from what you just said. And I think we've seen Parliament, especially in the last couple of years before the December election, being what it should be. That's that, that's how it should be. And if we had a proportional electoral system, then we would see that uh, uh, all the time. Every measure would have to stand or fall on its own merits. So that would be a really great thing. From the point of view of codification, I mean, obviously, uh, you don't want to uh, have a constitution which has become holy writ, like the American constitution. Any, any codification of the arrangements that govern the powers and limits of, of um, the offices of government and the people who populate them and so on should be such that they have built into them a, a mature, sensible way of uh, being adjusted and modified in response to need. What we've got at the moment, an uncodified constitution, is a constitution that can be gamed and played and interpreted any old way by whoever happens to be in government at the moment. All you have to do is to look at the, at the referendums that we've had in this country since 1973, prior to which, by the way, referendums were regarded as the instrument of demagogues and tyrants. You may remember what Clement Attlee said about, them, about that. But every referendum here has been held on a different basis. In 1979, the Scottish Devolution referendum, it had a, a threshold built into it. 
the 2011 uh, PR referendum had uh, said that it would be mandating. The 2016 referendum had no threshold. It was said to be advisory only because it couldn't uh, overturn the sovereignty of parliament. So if you don't have clarity and consistency in the arrangements that you make for these things, then they can just be just be played every time. And so they are. So, I mean, you know, I, I really think that uh, a lot of the problems that we're in now are the result of the fact that we have for too long relied on what J J John Stuart Mill, in his book, 1862, Representative Government, <laughs> what he described as constitutional morality. So let, let me just explain what that means, okay? Leslie Stephen, Virginia Woolf's father, in, a, in an essay said, we have a sovereign parliament. If parliament decided that blue-eyed babies should be uh, killed, uh, then that would be the law. And, and, and nobody could uh, say anything against it and would have to happen. But, he said, that would never happen. Why? Because our legislators are gentlemen. Now, that essay was published exactly 50 years before the Nazis came to power in Germany, where it wasn't blue-eyed babies, but it was a lot of other people who didn't smell right for whoever happened to be in power at the time. Now, John Stuart Mill, in that book that I, that I cited, used this phrase constitutional morality to describe this phenomenon, which he and Leslie Stephen and others thought. We have an all-powerful parliament, but it's populated by gentlemen, of course, are the males, you know, gentlemen, and they would never do things that are silly or stupid. They would always act genuinely in the interests of the country. Well, I'm afraid when you have a, a, an all-powerful parliament unconstrained by any kind of um, codified uh, sense of uh, what the limits to power are, how it should be exercised, with what goals and, and aims. If you don't have that, and you don't have gentlemen in parliament, you have people, a clique, a cabal, who are you know, absolutely determined um, to get something through because they hate Europe or they want their tax haven status or whatever it might be, then we are in big trouble. And that is exactly where we are now, in big trouble. Is, is their limit not the electorate? Is it not their constituents, you know, the good people of X voted me in and then five years later the bastards voted me out? I mean, that, that, is, that is their constraint, isn't it? At, at the end of the day, it's, it's the British people who control the MPs. I mean, we can say that Parliament is sovereign, but sovereignty also rests with the electorate. The MPs represent them. Well, two things to say there. The, the first is that there is this uh, incredible ambiguity in our constitutional arrangements in which we have a sovereign parliament, which means that parliament can do whatever it likes independently of what the people think. So it's not the people who are sovereign, although MPs that very often, you know, pull that lever or ring that bell uh, or whistle for that particular dog when it suits them. OK, but the second and more important point is this. I ran the numbers by you earlier on. 43% of votes cast gave a massive majority to the Conservatives in Parliament. And that 43% represented just 29% of the total electorate. So 29% of the total electorate have handed the power, the total, complete, sovereign power in this country to Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party. And how that happens is that because of the first-past-the-post system, a very, very few votes, a very small margin of votes tips the balance just a few votes will give a cascade of seats to one party rather than the other so it is not the people voting in fact if you voted for a losing candidate your vote is worth nothing i mean one of the fundamental principles of democracy is that each one of us has a voice and nobody has a louder voice than anybody else that each one of us has a vote that is equal but in a first past the post system such as we have now uh, the majority of votes because governments are always elected on a minority. I mean, 43% for the Conservatives last time, 57% for other parties, is always a minority that elects the government. That means the majority of us have a vote that is worth nothing. It has no influence, and we are unrepresented. I'm enjoying this conversation. You're forcing me into a defence of first-past-the-post, which is not, not a position <laughs> I usually find myself in. Um, just finally, Anthony, um, I wonder, where, where, where do you think... Where can people find solace in this time? Um, it's, it's an extraordinary moment, people isolated by themselves, in some many instances alone. Where do you think the British people can find solace in moments like this? Well, uh, th th there are a number of sources. So at the most abstract level, the, the only thing that cannot be undone is death. 
that that is why it matters that we should try to protect lives to to nourish and nurture and care for for lives because a living person the vast majority of, of people who are alive today are connected to other people and when people die that is a horrible wound in other people's lives you know so so the only irreversible thing is death and, that, and that's why we have to, to fight it because we can we could if we prepared properly for this we put the, the resources the efforts and the and, and the communality into this that then we can do that but everything else uh, is not permanent so Brexit isn't permanent and COVID is not permanent. I mean, there, were, there are going to be ways back from these things. And then my own view is, and I'm very much hoping to be able to still be around in 10 or 15 years' time so that I can see, I see us back in the EU. I can see us having, uh, having learned n- not just how to deal with coronaviruses of various kinds, because they are a major threat, but how to deal with viruses. You know, we've, we've got antibiotics for bacterial infections uh, and, mi- and microbial infections, but what, what, how, we can't deal properly with uh, viruses. We've made some progress, but there has to be a big scientific um, breakthrough uh, on that. And that may come out of this emergency. So, you know, the, the, there's always hope that, that we, can, we can put things right, we can go back, however long it takes. One should never, ever give up on things that really matter. If something is genuinely worthwhile, then we could keep fighting for it and, and we could get back there. And then the, the, the other two sources of hope, just very, very briefly, well, one is in our, in our relationships. I mean, at the heart of, of good lives are good relationships. The, the people we love and the people we're loved by are our friends. And um, just, you know, even the, the very simplest things like um, quick email to see if somebody's OK or chatting to somebody on Skype. You know, my brother lives in uh, in Australia and we, we Skype uh, uh, every now and then. And I always feel greater after I've seen him and spoken to him. So that's one thing. And the other thing that gives us hope is that however bad a situation is, and this is a really bad situation, but however bad it is, there are always those little kind of opportunities in the margins. So here we all are, locked down, we're at home. Um, I'm, I'm finding that this has given me several more hours a day, actually. So I'm now my, you know, a day is 24 hours and you're meant to be asleep for eight of them. But suddenly a day is now 30, 36 hours because you've suddenly found that you've got opportunities to do stuff, to read or, or to learn something and so on. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, pious things have come out, you know, people saying, oh, well, if you don't take, if you haven't learned something new, like a language or how to play the piano or something, by the end of COVID, then you've really let yourself down. Okay, well, that just puts the pressure on everybody. But, you know, I, I have to say, I, I'm finding that. I've got a big uh, um, a big book that I'm uh, working on at the moment, writing, and I've got so much more uh, time for it now, even though we have this great complex business of um, our college has had to move online. We're doing all our examining uh, in the college online. I've got a wonderful, wonderful team of uh, colleagues in the college who are managing this wonderfully well. But, you know, that, that takes thought, it takes care. We're learning a lot from that. That will change things about how we do things in future too. So there are always things to learn, opportunities to take, and one can take solace in that as well. Perfect. I think that's a good place to leave it. AC Grayling, thank you very much for taking your time to speak to us. Thanks, Ollie. Lovely to talk to you.